Okay. Hi, good morning. I'm Ariel Sabellino from the Philippine Press Institute. It's a national association of newspapers in the Philippines. My question is, what do you do when people themselves in the government are purveyors of fake news or disinformation? What do I do or what should one do? What you should do or what the government do, those kinds, and people in the government like you, mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> promoting or let, let, just making it stay that way. I, you know, as I said, it's about empowering individuals, media consumers, citizens, et cetera, to make that decision, to have the power to call that out. We as a government um, aren't going to solve it. We know that. We can do our best to um, defend and advance certain values. As in that Reuters Institute study, most people don't think the government is going to be the solution. The evolution that's happening in digital and social media came from the private sector, it came from civil society, it came from innovation, it came from creativity. That's where the solutions are going to come from too. So how are we at the State Department creating an environment to help that thrive and flourish so that people and individuals themselves, journalists, media consumers themselves are coming up with the solutions to this problem? Okay. Hi. Uh, over on the right? Oh. I'm sorry, the left, Hi. that's you. Uh, how important is it for politicians to not slander media houses by calling them fake news so that people are not encouraged to lose faith in media houses without reason? And on the corollary, is there a need for an institutional me mechanism to hold governments accountable if they are caught peddling disinformation and misinformation themselves? Uh, you said it's up to the American people to decide. One of the biggest sources of information is naturally the American government. So when the government is peddling misinformation and disinformation, should there be an institutional mechanism to hold them accountable for that? So the American people are the mechanism to hold us accountable. They are our customer. They're the ones at the end of the day who, because they have free speech, can voice their opinion. They can also go vote. They are also the customers of the news media. So it's out there for them to decide. I would also add that the American press is, is the... Uh, holds the government accountable to the extent that, that we can. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to extend the, uh, the oh. discussion on the inherent contradiction that you mentioned, Ambidayak from India. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just wondering where the president discredits some of the established media. And I'm just wondering when we talk about uh, in the panel before this, we talked about media literacy training. Uh, how do you actually do the media literacy training where you have these contradictions, where you have the president discrediting some of the established media? And you've said, well, it's a healthy debate. But then in that debate, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, how do you do the media, media literacy training in terms of, doesn't it create a kind of a confusion in the, in, in the, the readership, the viewership, and you know, in the public as such? So I'm just wondering how, how would that happen in, if the... the the government was to take this thing forward. Thank you. So what was the exact question? No, I'm just saying, I mean, where you have the president of the United States discrediting some of the established media. And we're also talking about media literacy training, right? And uh, then it, it's also the job of the government to sort of come forward and take this media literacy training uh, to the people. So, I mean, there is a contradiction there. I mean, it's from what the president is saying and for the way the message is coming out from the government and let's say you having those press briefings every day. So how do you sort of, how do you uh, adjust these contradictions and how do we do that media literacy training? There is no contradiction. The president of the United States has been clear in calling out fair and inaccurate news when he believes it to be so. It's his right. And it's out there again for the American public to listen to, to decide on. They also have access to news that they can listen to, that they can decide on. We have a, a fair and open market of information, if you will. So there's a conversation that's happening, but at the end of the day, it's the American media consumer, it's the American citizen that has access to information coming from the government and coming from the news, coming from their friends on social media. They, at the end of the day, are the ones making an informed decision. Of course, though, um, you know, we have often referred to the presidential power of speech as the bully pulpit. Um, you know, certainly the president 
wields a lot of power, and when he discredits uh, media, it's going to have a very powerful effect, particularly on, on for, you know, on, for his supporters, who and will undermine the media. So, how do you overcome that when when you are teaching media literacy? What do you say to people, you know, uh, when when they ask? But he's so much more powerful than everybody else. I mean, the question about whether or not it undermines media, again, is up to the American people. If in their mind, and as they listen to conversations that the president is having and that the news media are having, having they, they decide whether or not it impacts their understanding and trust in news or trust in, in information that's coming from their friends on social media. So it's an open market, if you will, of information, and they, at the end of the day, are the ones empowered to decide if, in fact, it, it impacts their decision. And but he's enjoying a, a very, a very um, high favorability rating still among the American people, one that matches Ronald Reagan and one that matches President Obama at this tenure. So, again, it's codified in our Bill of Rights, freedom of speech and freedom of press. As long as we're having a debate around that and the American people are the ones making a decision at the end of the day, we're in good shape. Would you say it's a fair fight? Sure it is. How many of you have a smartphone in here? How many of you right now could tweet, could post something? Of course it's fair. Everybody, especially in the United States, because of freedom of speech, you can post anything you want. You can have any conversation you want. That's incredibly powerful. So whether it's a government, whether it's a media, whether it's individual citizens, we're all having a conversation. We all have an equal voice. All right, so we're going to go way up at the top. Uh, Tom Grundy from Hong Kong Free Press. I think in memory, and I, sp I speak for a lot of uh, media leaders here probably, the, no one has done more to damage uh, press freedom globally than the current US administration. And this fake news narrative has been pounced upon by authoritarian leaders in places like Cambodia and Burma. I think you're getting the same question quite a lot, but how would you define uh, fake news? Because the last panel was talk talking about it being news I don't like. Fake news is misinformation and disinformation. You talk about that being a, a healthy and a dialogue and debate in the US, but it seems that a lot of fake news is, is simply factual news or news that Donald Trump doesn't, doesn't like. I'll say this again. <laughs> I keep getting this, the same question. The president has been clear in calling out fair and accurate information where he believes it to be so. It is up to the American people then to have a conversation about it. It is up to the news media to have a conversation about it, and they are. Look at the conversation we're having now. But there's no limit on it. The Bill of Rights are laws protecting freedom of the press and free speech codify and protect our ability to have that conversation. It's not a healthy debate, okay, though. It's I'm a gonna, damaging debate. I'm going to uh, <laughs> let someone else go. Jocelyn? Uh, thank you. I'm Jocelyn Ford. I'm a Beijing-based journalist, and I have a little bit of a different question for you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. China offers a different uh, model. Uh, it, it, it believes in guiding public policy. It does not believe in dissent. Uh, it, it believes in controlling dissent. It believes in censorship, and it is increasingly active internationally in promoting its policies to other countries countries and offering these sort of cyber tools in order to do this. And I'm wondering, is the U.S. policy adjusted to account for this? Is this a concern? In addition to the sorts of programs you've mentioned, uh, are there additional trainings as, as might China might be training other governments that it offers help to in its uh, approaches to media controls? Is the U.S. countering that specifically? Yeah, we have um, another program I didn't mention is a um, U.S.-China journalist exchange, too, and we have some colleagues here from our embassy in Beijing. Uh, Alice, I think, is here. Raise your Yeah, Alice is up there. Um, but we participate in journalist exchanges um, and similar conversations in China and have been clear in um, our position on freedom of the press there and um, protection of journalists and, and reporters as well. So very similar programs. Okay, um, on the left. Hi, I'm actually going to bring us back to the uh, previous topic for a minute. So in addition to the uh, criticism that we've seen from President Trump for the news media, uh, he has also repeatedly uh, perpetrated um, 
his own disinformation. I'm thinking, for example, well, many examples, but thinking recently about uh, crime statistics in Germany that he tweeted out, which have absolutely no source and are completely untrue. Um, I'm curious. I mean, I, I believe that there, I believe that there are people in the State Department and the administration who um, sincerely want to tackle these issues abroad. But how how much credibility do you have in, when you are uh, coming from an administration uh, where your president is is a source of disinformation himself. Do people still believe that that you're serious? Well, <laughs> I, don't, I don't agree with your assertion, but as I mentioned I, earlier, we engage with and invite the press into the State Department every day. They, they sit and they work in the second floor of the State Department. So we are having a constant conversation. Again, we bring them into the press briefing room. We bring them into the foreign press center in New York, in DC, into our media hubs across the world. So we're having a constant conversation and dialogue with press. Um, we give them access to our assistant secretaries, to our undersecretaries, to our ambassadors, so they can have fair and, and transparent and open conversations. So um, our credibility issue and our, our transparency, um, I think, speaks to the degree with which we value our relationship with the press. OK, thank you. In the middle. I just want to clarify because you keep saying, you know, we're having this healthy debate and people are empowered to make the decision about whether or not they believe media is true. I just want to make sure and clarify you are saying that it's okay that President Trump debates facts and introduces alternative narratives and realities into the dialogue. That's part of the debate we're having and you're okay with that. That's what you're saying. No, ma'am. I am saying that he has been clear in calling out unfair and inaccurate information. And it, again, it's up to our public and news consumers and citizens to decide. Okay. Yeah, I'm Howie Severino from uh, GMA Network in the Philippines. Um, the United States has uh, long been a beacon of hope and democracy uh, to countries around the world, uh, including my own. Uh, what is uh, the State Department saying now, or is it, what is it allowed to say to countries where democracy is in retreat? Um, we work across levels and across um, either the media or with our, our um, government to government conversations in promoting shared values. So number one, and the president has talked about this um, consistently, is human dignity. And how do you create opportunities for every individual to unlock their full potential? How do you create um, opportunities for people to achieve shared dreams together, to have a free and open press, to um, engage in careers and in, in um, education paths that they want to? So that happens on a government-to-government -government, um, conversation. It happens from our perspective and how we communicate on social media, from the podium to press, um, and in conversations like this, where we engage uh, media and journalists and um, public and private sector partners across the world. Okay, so uh, we have two more minutes, so we're going to take two more questions, and we're going to start way up at the top. Hi, I, I think you're absolutely right to note that um, there will be time for the American public to make their judgment about uh, uh, President Trump's statements, and the media can have make their judgments as well. But in a, in a traditional American administration, it would not be too difficult for people who work in the administration to support what the president says, as opposed to say, it's something that is worthy of public debate, and isn't it wonderful that we're having that debate? You've worked with the, with the media uh, for, for some time. You work with the media on a day-to-day -day basis, the New York Times, the Washington Post. These are institutions that the president has said invent sources, doctor quotes, are sources of disinformation, are fake news. Uh, so just personally, not the American people, but you as an individual, do you believe that the New York Times and the Washington Post are fake news? I'm not here speaking on behalf of my, my personal opinions. I'm here speaking on behalf of the State Department and the American government. Does the State Department believe that the New York Times is fake news? The State Department engages with the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and Reuters and Bloomberg and Politico and CNN and other media outlets on a day-to-day -day basis to have a healthy conversation and be transparent and clear about our policies and our values. Is it, is it at all telling that you're unwilling to agree with your president on, on that point? I support the president fully. So you, you agree and it I is fake news. And I, I also support and I work for the, the citizens of the United States. And ultimately, they have the power to decide um, what they think is fair and accurate. 
I look forward to your memoir. USA Today, but I won't hold that against and you. US, oh, we do work very closely with USA Today, too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so can I take two more questions or just one more? All right, because all right, because Guy's going to get mad at me. But yes, the uh, uh, you're the first Ambassador. question. Uh, oh, 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 I, I last question. Oh, yeah. Have, I just had oh, a follow up. A repeat. Yeah. This okay. Yeah. Really short. Well, really can short. Can we hear from the ambassador since you've already had a chance to ask a question? Oh, all right. We are. Oh, you've already asked a question. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to have the ambassador ask the last question. Just. Uh, Totally different subject. Um, going back to the, even the last administration, there has been a continuous problem of China denying visas or greatly delaying visas for American journalists. And there's been a debate going back to the Obama administration, maybe even earlier, what do we do about that? Do we uh, insist on reciprocity? Do we hold up visas for Chinese journalists? Or does that go against our values? How is that issue being dealt with, and what's the uh, current state of uh, policy uh, today? Um, you know, I, that's a great question. I'm not sure of the latest policy, and maybe our colleague uh, Walter Douglas here, um, who works in our EAP Bureau, has um, better insight into that. Um, I do know, look, we engage with our counterparts in the Chinese government, um, and then across Southeast Asia, um, to call for an open and free press and to um, engage, we engage with um, Chinese media and other media in the United States as well, right, as part of our um, foreign press center and, and reporters from across the region. So um, we make sure that we're having and providing access to um, reporters from all across the world, to our leaders, to our policy, to our information. Um, but I, I don't know about the latest um, on that specific policy issue. Okay. All right, well, thank you all very much for